everyone, this is Victoria Toka. In this week's episode of Toka Talks, I'm speaking to Mary Jess, the British classical crossover soprano who won China's version of The Voice. Well, <laughs> welcome to Toka Talks, Mary Jess. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here. <laughs> I'm so excited to have you here. Are you eating? What are you doing? Oh, it's my tea. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Because it's important. I just, I run on it. It's like your car needs petrol or diesel. I need some tea. <laughs> I see. Yes. You're from Britain. So tea, is, yeah. you know, what you need. <laughs> it's important. <laughs> Anyways, for the people who don't know who you are, um, since I'm assuming this is a little bit outside of your normal arena, maybe, or have you done a lot of musical theater? Have you done musical theater? No, I never have. I've sung a lot of the songs. Right. Um, and then I've always been a recording artist. Um, yeah. On my own, <laughs> rather than being part of a cast, which always sounded like so much fun. Like being a, a solo recording artist, you're always doing everything on your own, like for yourself, by yourself, everything. Whereas being part of a cast has always appealed to me. I mean, I'm really excited that I've been able to do both uh, throughout my career because. Mm. Uh, I mean, there are people who are um, constantly doing uh, musical theatre and that's what they do. And I've always been really grateful and happy that I've been able to both do that and be part of a cast and a show. And then also been able to develop like my own voice and my own self as an artist, if you will. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, you've been able to develop your own stance not only within musical theatre but as a recording artist in your own right with your own sound with right. your own sound world and your own voice and yeah it's wonderful what you've been able to do because quite a lot of the time with musical theatre it is so draining it's difficult mm. to find the time to do the other stuff yeah yeah I mean once you're in a show you're really especially if you're in one of the bigger shows where you play like six or eight shows a week or something like that, there is no time for anything else. That's what you do. And exactly. period. Um, so it's hard to, to be able to do everything else as well. But one of the reasons that I wanted to talk to you on this show is um, because I think your journey would be really inspiring for other artists and maybe particularly for musical theater people who have mainly done musical theater and, and that's it, who maybe uh, might not know how to, you know, reach out and be their own artist as well. I mean, the, the genre that you and I work in is something called classical crossover. Do you want to like explain the classical crossover genre to people who don't really know what it is? Yeah, of course. I think the way that I've always described it that seems to work best is if you say that contemporary music is over here and you've got straight opera over here, stick your hands together and somewhere in the middle you get classical crossover. And that's what I've always loved about this genre is because you've got such a wide spectrum of music to take inspiration from and put together mm. into your own little version of classical crossover. So uh, that's what I really love about it. I love the scope that it gives you artistically mm. and creatively in order to create your own sound because you've got so many different places that you can get inspiration from, make your own little thing. Right. So one of the things, or like, I don't know if it's the biggest thing, but I'm assuming it's a really big thing, is that you won the Chinese version of The Voice. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. That's huge. <laughs> so how, like, <clears throat> okay. So how did that happen? Because one, um, how did you even get the idea of auditioning for the Chinese version of The Voice? Like, how did that whole thing come about? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't really come up with the idea. It wasn't something where I went, I am going to go and audition for that. Uh, <laughs> that was really what happened. <laughs> okay, um, so what happened? Well, it was, it was China's own version of that type of show. So mm -hmm. it wasn't, um, 
the voice and it wasn't okay. Simon Cowell's um, X Factor, you know, that brand. It was their own idea of that show. So what China's quite good at doing is they see a concept that they like and they go, oh, that's brilliant. I'll do my own version of that. Mm. Um, and created their own version, which was called Minxing Chang Fan Tian. So Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> so if everyone repeats after Mary Jess, it was called? <laughs> Minxing Chang Fan Tian. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's what it was called. So, um, but yeah, it was. I didn't wake up one morning and go, "That's a great idea. I should do that." I was aware of the shows, but I was 19 years old at the time, and I was at university. Mm -hmm. Now, I feel like I should explain the story of getting to university and why I decided to study what I did before we <laughs> yes. moved on to the yes. X Factor, because um, or that their version of it because um, I decided to choose a really weird dual honours degree. And mm -hmm. that's because when I was growing up, I was going around telling everyone, hey, I'm gonna be a singer. And their response wasn't great, which is what I was hoping for or expecting. It was, uh, what are you really gonna do? <laughs> it's not really encouragement that you want. <laughs> not really, no. Not when you're excited about an idea. So, um, I'd go around saying that I wanted to be a singer and, and the only person who really said to me, that's great, you should do that, um, was my grandma. Mm. She, but she, she said, that's a great idea, you should do that. But then she followed up with a very brilliant piece of advice, mm. which was to always have more than one string to your bow. Right. So you can tell from that reference that she was a musical person. Mm. She was a semi-professional classical singer Mm. and she really wanted to encourage my love of music so she said that's great but just make sure that you've got something else so for her she was she did classical singing semi-professionally but her professions was she was a florist and a hairdresser mm. so she always had something that she could fall, fall back on if one of them wasn't going quite so well and that was an amazing piece of advice and so I was going through school wondering what my second string could be mm. because I loved singing and I loved music and I wanted to find something that I felt equally as passionate about right. to be my second string so as I was going through school I was remembering my grandma's motto but also remembering one that my mum gave me which was to make the most of every single opportunity available to you always mm. so whenever an opportunity came up I take it straight away thinking maybe this could be my second string. Maybe this can be something that I'd enjoy just as much as music. And I tried to do that when Spanish was offered as, an, as um, another subject for GCSE at school. So in the UK, when you're 16, you take your GCSE exams. Mm -hmm. So that was being offered as another GCSE that you could take. But it was only the people who were in the very top set for French, only the people who were very good at French, that would be allowed to learn Spanish and have that extra workload. I was not one of those people. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was just going to say I chose French as well, and I only know all the bad words. In <laughs> yeah. no. If you've got a good case of road rage in France, you know, you can use some of those. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. I can also get laid in French. So, yay. <laughs> oh, but yeah, I was not particularly good at French at all. I tried, but this just wasn't something I was naturally good at. But I thought Spanish would be great. I was really excited about Spanish because it was the third most widely spoken language in the world. Right. So I thought, well, that's an opportunity because who knows what that could lead to. That'd be yeah. amazing. Um, so what I decided to do was I had a letter from my mum and I went in to see my French teacher because he was the head of the languages department. So he had all of the decision making power as to who would be allowed to learn what. Mm. So I went into him and I said, I know, I know, I realise that I'm not that good at French. You know, I get it. But please let me learn Spanish because I just think it would be an amazing opportunity. I would absolutely love it I will work so hard at French and I'll work so hard at Spanish please will you let me learn it and I handed him the note from my mum which mm -hmm. basically said the same thing 
he took the note from me. Yeah. But he didn't look at it. He put it down on his desk. Mm -hmm. He said no. What? Now. Now. I have very bad words in <laughs> English that I could use right now as well. If you want I could to do with some of your bad French words for this exact moment. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, what so that was um, not quite the response that I was hoping for. Because <laughs> um, it wasn't just the word that he said, that no word that just made me feel really upset. It was, it was the way he looked at me as well. And it mm. was not something that I was expecting because the look that he gave me mm. was one that I had seen before, but not from him. Hmm. and not from an adult that look that he gave me was one that I got when I was in the school playground hmm. and it was one when I was asking the kids can I play with you yeah or do you want to be friends and they'd look at me in a way as if to say why should we even bother with you right and it was a look that I was quite used to getting because I was the kid in school who was coming from a single parent home mm. in a rough area. I was coming to school with my secondhand clothes, mm. not with the most fashionable stuff, not with the latest backpack that you needed to be cool. None of that stuff. We mm. just couldn't afford it. And so the kids would give me the look as if to say, why should we even bother with you? Mm. And I'd kind of, I'd learned to accept that from other kids in the playground. You kind of think, yeah, well, kids are mean, but they don't yeah. know who I am. They don't know what I feel like I can achieve. They just see what's on the outside. And right. I could kind of let that just go off my back and not worry about it. Yeah. But to see that look from an adult, that was upsetting, yeah. especially from somebody in a position of power within the education system where mm. they're supposed to be encouraging people who want to learn. Right. When you've got a child coming to you saying, please, I just want to learn. Yeah. And they, they say no and give you a look like that. It was not what I was expecting at all. And it really shook me. I just, I ran out of his office crying. <laughs> I, was, I was 12 years old at this point. And, and every time I'd see the kids going in for their Spanish lessons, I thought, why couldn't that have been me? So the one thing that I really wanted to do from that point on was I wanted to show him. Mm. I wanted to show him that he should have taken that chance on me yeah. and that I was somebody to bother with. And I did deserve that chance just because I didn't have the backpack that all the other cool kids had. And just because I came from a, a really poor and rough area from a single parent family doesn't mean that I can't achieve things mm. it doesn't mean that i will never amount to anything just because of where i've come from mm. and i really wanted to prove that not only to him but to everybody else from that point onwards yeah and so it was a few weeks later that a new subject became available and this was going to be an extracurricular subject. So it was after school. It mm. wasn't part of the main curriculum. So I was able to take that class without asking permission from my French teacher or from mm. anybody. Mm. And that was Mandarin Chinese. Right. So as soon as that opportunity came, I was thinking that could be the second string to my bow that's an opportunity that I mm. need to make the most of. And I need to show my peers, my French teacher, that I do deserve a chance to learn something. Right. And that I can amount to something. But when I took Mandarin Chinese, the one thing I didn't expect, well, two things. I didn't expect to be good at it was the first one. <laughs> <laughs> no. Because I, I wasn't very good at French. So when Mandarin Chinese is one of the hardest languages you could possibly learn, I wasn't expected to be good at it at all. But I also wasn't expecting to love it so much. Mm. 
it's so interesting. And it's so, for me at that point, it was so alien because you had these musical tones, you had all the different sounds, you had all the characters as well. There's no alphabet. Right. So it was a really new, interesting thing that I just fell in love with. And I think when you love something mm. and you're willing to spend the time on it, that is the recipe for success. Because even if you're not innately good at it, you want to spend the time learning it and therefore you get good at it anyway. Yeah. And so because I loved it so much, I spent all the time I could learning Mandarin Chinese and I was able then to show my French teacher that I did deserve more of a chance because I got the top grade in my GCSE for Mandarin Chinese. Mm. Not so much for French. I didn't... <laughs> After well, that conversation, it can went. Can you even swear further. in Mandarin Chinese? <laughs> I only know one bad word. Really? And that's because I was at one at one point I was dealing with a, a TV producer in China mm. um, called Mr. Cao, mm -hmm. and I had to make sure that I pronounced it correctly every single time with the with the right tone because a different tone is the F word in Chinese. Oh no. <laughs> so I didn't want to accidentally call him, oh, hello, mister. Mm. No, that would be bad. But that's what's really scary about Mandarin. I mean, like, I have never really tried it, but they've asked me a couple of times. Um, my, my record company in Hong Kong has asked me if I would like to record uh, songs in either Mandarin or Cantonese, which is like the other Chinese um, language. And I'm just terrified of it because exactly what you just said, if like it might be exactly the same word or pronunciation, it, like the nuance is so subtle and so, and it can mean completely different things and get yeah. you in big trouble. It so. totally can, but but that's also part of the the musicalness of it because because mm. you've got those tones. That's what makes the language so musical. It, like even speaking. Mm. Um, so a good way. I've got two demonstrations I can do for you. The first one is just the word ma. Ma can have by itself uh, well at least five different meanings, okay. um, depending on how you say it. So you've got the four tones, and then there's a non tone. And that is ma 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 ma. And they all right. Have five different I'm so confused. <laughs> so, <laughs> ma 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 ma. Yeah, exactly. Which I'm amazing. Huh? I should totally learn Mandarin. I'm so good. Oh, you should. Totally, honestly, you totally should. It's amazing. <laughs> um, but the, the second demonstration using those tones, it just goes to show how musical it is. So. The best way I describe this and, and use this example is by saying, when you say one to 10, when you speak in English, yeah. one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, it's not particularly musical. Right. But you say it in Mandarin with the tones and instantly it's got a tune. It's beautiful. E, I, San, Si, Wu, Liu, Qi, Ba, Jiu, Shi. Okay. I think it's lovely. <laughs> yeah, yes, it is. It is, and, and I, was just uh, speaking to um, another uh, singer, um, you know, that I did an interview with, and we were discussing um, German and Danish, uh, which are two languages that I've been um, able to work in, um, in musicals. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's funny because when you don't know a language, it might just you know, be a bunch of sounds, but once you start understanding or learning it, it becomes really beautiful. For example, with German, you know, my only connection to German growing up was, you know, they're bad Nazis because that's what you saw in film, right? So German was like an ugly, horrible language because it was associated with something bad. But once you start learning German, and understanding it, you do realize it's a really beautiful language. So I'm just assuming it's the same with Mandarin, for example. I mean, right now it's just like um, sounds to me. 
that makes you know no sense but uh you know no but <laughs> when you know it i'm sure it's really beautiful and the more you learn you know yeah and i might be slightly biased as well because i love it <laughs> you're, always, you're always biased when you love something aren't you yeah but you know <laughs> some languages are like italian does it for me like that's beautiful I don't understand it, but you know, I can just sit and listen to someone speak Italian because it's like, oh, that's mm. nice. It is. You're completely yeah. right. It's mm. a really beautiful language, that one. Um, I think that Italian for me is one of my favorite languages to sing in, um, mm. but then also Chinese is as well, just because I do think it's beautiful. Um, mm. And I, I like to take the musicality of the tones into the songs even though when you're singing in mandarin you actually throw the tones out the window they don't mm. use them because mm -hmm. you'd be changing the meaning of the sentence all the while when you're singing <laughs> right <one> right <laughs> but it's nice when you get to sing in mandarin and, and give it the same musicality in music as as mm. you do in the spoken language so i do really enjoy that but the, the other thing i really enjoy about singing in mandarin is that a lot of the the sounds in Mandarin can be quite towards the front of your mouth and quite closed. Mm -hmm. So then trying to have a nice open sound when you're singing in quite closed vowels, I quite like that contrast. Right. Um, and that's quite a fun thing to negotiate. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so do you make that negotiation with yourself or like, how does that happen? <laughs> well, it's like words like, um, which is the number 10. Yeah. Or you can also have sh, which means is or to sure, be. Sure. Yeah. Like, that was really good. I'm going to be so good at this language. Yay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was amazing. So yeah, it's a very closed sound. So but then you... once again, right. when, when is it 10? 10. Shi. Yeah, that was amazing. And the and other one. If you say is or to be, sh. Sh. Yeah. Oh my gosh. You seriously so you talented. Know, you pick that up so quickly. <laughs> I know. I can say two words now. Like I almost panicked. Um, I was doing this huge concert in Beijing and um, it was like, I don't know, about almost like 20, 30,000 people. I don't know. I was part of this big um, concert. It, I was the only Western um, singer. And for some reason, they wanted me to say, you know, something super simple um, in, I'm assuming it was Mandarin. In Beijing, probably, yeah. Yeah, they wanted me to say something like, um, hello, Beijing, or hello, China. Anyway, and it was like the most stressful thing for me. Of, for the entire like week I was there that I would have to say those things in Mandarin. Not the fact that I was, you know, like coming up through the floor on like an evolving, you know, little stage thingy without any handrails or anything. It was moving and I was in high heels and I had to sing and all this stuff. None of it, that really bothered me. What I was stressing out for like a whole week was the fact that I would have to say like four words in Mandarin. So. <laughs> well, if it was four words, was it Ni Hao Beijing? Was it that? Hello Beijing? Well, yeah, Ni Hao Beijing, I can say, but then I had to say Ni, um, ni Hao. I mean, how do you say China in Mandarin? Zhongguo. Yeah, Zhongguo. So that was my stress for a whole week. Like Ni Hao, whatever. I, I forgot get, again. I completely understand. I mean, <laughs> Ni Hao Beijing and Ni Hao Gungzhuo. That was close. Ni Hao so close. <laughs> Ooh, oh, there you go. So yeah. I, I wrote it down. I got my finger and I probably still said it wrong. But they all applauded me and they were very happy that I tried. So yeah, good. that's the great thing about the Chinese, though, is as soon as you make an effort to learn their language, they really appreciate it because they know how hard it is. Yeah, it's not easy. So they really appreciate it, which is lovely. And I really feel like, I mean, I can say this as an English person, but when you get foreigners coming over to England in whatever capacity mm. and then trying to speak English, I see people get impatient with them and I go, wait a minute, this right. is not their first language. Right. It's hard. Like we've got all these tenses everywhere. 
Mm. And all these different words that sound exactly the same, but have different meanings. The same thing with Chinese. <laughs> right. Like, have some patience. It really yeah. drives me crazy. You've got the amount of hard work you've got to put in to learn in a language when you yeah. have a from birth. It is not your mother tongue. It's hard. Yeah. So when I see people, well, English people, I've seen it a lot, when they get impatient with foreign people trying to speak, you go, encourage that because it's hard work. They're yeah. trying. That's the main point. You know, I don't I don't understand why people get grumpy about it. It yeah. annoys me. <laughs> so you learned Mandarin and then ended up singing in the Chinese version of The Voice. All right, yeah, I've got to finish that story, haven't I? Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, we went off on a whole rant about other things. But anyways, <laughs> trying to tie it together here. <laughs> Um, very well tied together because I feel like Thank I've you. talked to you about anything for such a long time. Um, so yes, I took Mandarin Chinese, I did my GCSE, I wanted to carry on studying um, at A level. So in England, you do your, your GCSEs, then you do your A levels, then you go to uni. Okay. So I really wanted to carry on with my Chinese, but I could not find a Chinese A level anywhere near me. We would have had to have moved house for me to do it. Oh. But luckily, my Chinese teacher, who was amazing, mm. she would let me come back into the classes, even though I wasn't at that school anymore, mm. so that I could keep it up, which was so nice of her. So I went on to do my A-levels course, I did music. And then when it came to university, I really wanted to study both music and Chinese. Mm. But I was, I was thinking I'd have to decide because music and Chinese is a pretty, bit of a crazy combination. Um, but I was so lucky. I just on a whim, I was not expecting anything to come up. I put in music and Chinese to the university search engine mm. and one university in the whole country came up and they offered Mandarin Chinese with Western classical music. Whoa. What? Like what? And you were like the only student. No, <laughs> but that's crazy. Yeah, I was. I was the only student doing that course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that just, it was made for me. And I heard the Alleluia chorus going off in my head when it came up. Oh, I was so chuffed. Um, I just couldn't believe it. I thought that is where I'm going. Now, everybody else's university forms at my school, they had like five different options. I was like, this is my one. <laughs> my teachers were like, you should probably have a few more options written down here. I was like, now, this is where I'm going. So I was lucky. That I got <laughs> lucky. Yeah. Where was this? Sheffield. Oh. So that's in the north of England. Mm -hmm. And the idea is, is that you go to Sheffield for your first year. And then they send you out to Nanjing University in the Jiangsu province of China for your second year. So normally in a mod modern languages degree, you go out in your third year, but for some reason they do it in the second for Chinese. So I spent my year at Sheffield, which is amazing, and then went to Nanjing. And that was quite possibly one of the best times of my life going and living in China. It was incredible. It was the most polar opposite experience to anything I'd ever experienced. And I loved it. But I was determined when I was over there to make the most of every single thing that I could. So if somebody would say to me, do you want to do this? I'd say, yes. Right. Do you want to do that? Yes. And I'd figure out how I was going to do it later. <laughs> Just Very good advice, yeah. everybody. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So I had tons of crazy, amazing experiences. <clears throat> um, just because I said yes to everything. So one of those things was my friend was taking part in a TV show at the TV studios um, because they wanted some foreign contestants to be part of this TV show that they were doing. It was like a game show thing. Mm. And he said, do you want to come and be my moral support and watch me do the show? Yes. Mm. <laughs> Sounds like a fun day out anyway, right? So it was good. Right. So I went along to the TV studios with him and I wasn't expecting it to be such a long day. They would have to, they were only using this one studio and they had to change all of the sets and the scenes and everything in between the different games. Oh. So it was a very long process. And during one of the set changes, 
I decided um, to be nosy. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I'm possibly a bit naughty. I'm not sure this is quite allowed. Um, and go exploring. So I decided that I would go exploring around the TV. You can always play dumb. You know, no. I didn't know I wasn't allowed. Yeah, exactly. Say sorry in Mandarin. Yeah. <laughs> like play like the dumb Westerner. Oh yeah, well, quite quite often I would play that, but you know, authentically because I really didn't understand what they were saying. Yeah. <laughs> so, because I'd only really been learning Chinese for about a year then, because I did the GCSE, but then you start from the beginning again when you go to uni. So, um, I could yeah normally get out of sticky situations by going, oh, I'm sorry, and then when they talk to me more, I go, oh, sorry, I don't understand, and they just leave it, and it was fine. <laughs> Okay, so you were sneaking off to be nosy in the TV studio. I was. Um, and I got to see so many cool things. And to think that is a massive complex. But the moment that changed my life mm. was sneaking into this one studio. Well, the door was just slightly open. And so I, I pushed it open a little bit, hoping it wouldn't creak too loudly so that people didn't know I was there. Pushed it open. And I saw through the crack in the door a Chinese man singing his heart out on the stage, really singing, really in the moment, really performing. And I thought, I know what that is. That is a singing competition. And that is quite possibly one of the biggest, most amazing opportunities I have ever seen in my whole life. Right. To get on that show. That was just instantly, that's an opportunity. I'm taking that, I'm getting on that show. Right. So I ran around the TV studios for over two hours trying to find the producer of this television program. And when I eventually found him, I said to him, which means I really love singing. Please, will you let me enter this singing competition? And he said two words to me. The first one was, okay. <laughs> um, and the second one was, sing. Oh. And that was it. But I was looking around thinking, what, here? <laughs> we right. were in this tiny room with dancers running in, grabbing their costumes for the next thing that they had to do, running back out again, and there were hundreds of them running in and hundreds of them running out, this tiny little room. And it was utter chaos. Right. And I thought, does he really want me to sing for him here? Like right here on the spot now. But then my little inner voice, it said, I could hear my mum's voice inside me just going, this is your opportunity. You need to make the most of it. You need to make the most of every single opportunity. And this is it. So I took a deep breath and I sang my favorite classical crossover song. There and then on the spot, I sang Time to Say Goodbye for him. Oh. And he said, okay, we'll get you on the show. Yay. And that was my audition. So when you said earlier, like, was it your intention to go and audition for this show and sing on the show? No, it wasn't. I just saw an opportunity and knew that I yeah. had to. And I think this is so, so important because I have a saying that I use a lot when I talk to people, um, either students or if I do like an inspirational speech at, um, you know, a company or something like that, which I'm asked to do sometimes. And it's, if you don't ask, the answer is always no. So this is one of those things because uh, it also means, you know, to take the opportunity when it's presented to you. So, um, or, you know, say yes and solve the problem later. Like you have to grab the things when they present themselves to you. If you would have said, no, I'm not ready. Can I sing for you another day? It might never have happened. Like you have to just go for it. And it's, 
super scary sometimes. It's like jumping off a cliff, not knowing if there's anything there to catch you, you know, but you have to take those opportunities when they come to you. The worst thing that could have happened is that he would have said, you know what, I don't think this show is for you. It's another, like we're doing another genre, whatever. But you tried and you did it. And, you know, consequently, got one of the biggest opportunities of your life because you had the courage to try and you had the courage to go nosing around that TV studio. But you know what I mean? Like maybe we shouldn't encourage people to like break into a TV studio and, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like ask, you know, ask yeah. otherwise you know the opportunity will absolutely not present itself probably mm -hmm. you have to ask and you have to dare to grab the opportunity when it's there so it's a really inspiring story so then you went on the show and you won yeah that was not what i was expecting <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy it was crazy it was the most crazy experience of my life it just yeah. <clears throat> there was no time to even think about the magnitude of what I was doing um, until afterwards, until then I realized, oh, hang on a minute. This is actually quite a, <laughs> quite so, a like, how did the show work? Was it like several um, rounds and, or like, how did the show work? Yeah. So there were a lot of rounds um, and it, it had many similarities to the shows that we're aware of. So like The Voice, like The X Factor, mm. there were many similarities. Like you had the judges there, you had mm. the rounds you had to get through, you had the different competitors with your big stage, um, mm. but there were some quite big differences. So there wasn't a live studio audience. Mm -hmm. You just had thousands of cameras on you mm. <laughs> at all times, which is a bit scary. Um, and instead of having a week to prepare, for each live show. Yeah. I was live on Chinese television every single night for three weeks. Whoa. There was no time to prepare. And I was not allowed to stop going to university for those three weeks either. This is China. They right. value their education more than anything else. Mm. So I was going to university for my classes at 8 a.m., doing all the classes, getting a taxi to the TV studios, going live on Chinese television, getting a taxi back to my dorms where I would then Skype my mum because that was the only way she would know what was going on. There's no right. Facebook, there's no YouTube, there's no Twitter, there's no Instagram, nothing like that in China. Right. The only way that my family in the UK knew what I was doing was because I would Skype my mum when I got home. Right. I'd go to sleep for about five hours, um, get up and do it all over again. <laughs> yeah. But so did you have like um, that many songs like prepared or how how did you do it I just sang everything that I knew because I'd I'd grown up going to karaoke's with my mum mm. that was my singing training we couldn't afford any official tuition so my training was going to a karaoke in a smoky pub because you were allowed <laughs> to smoke in pubs back then making me sound old here <laughs> and singing karaoke to drunk people who didn't care that was my training. So I had pop songs, rock songs. I had the operatic arias that I was learning as part of my um, GCSEs and A-levels. Mm. And I also had some Chinese songs that I'd learnt um, as part of my studying of Mandarin. And so I just sang everything I knew. So I went from singing Stop by Sam Brown, which is this mm. big sort of pop rock song, to mm. singing a Chinese song, to singing Oh Mio Babino Caro, mm. and uh, just everything, <laughs> everything. Yeah. There was no time to learn anything new. Right. So I had to sing everything that I knew, and that was the only way to get through it. But I saved time to say goodbye, because I was thinking, that's the song that I auditioned with. Yeah. And if I am lucky enough to get to the final, that should be the song that I sang in the final. But I didn't think I'd ever actually get to that point because mm. I was the only Westerner, same as right. you when you were in Beijing, I was the only Westerner in the whole competition. And I was thinking, why would the Chinese public vote for an English girl rather than the Chinese? Surely they'd want the Chinese to win their version of the X Factor. 
Mm. I wasn't expecting it to be me. But every night when I was getting voted through, mm. that little flame of hope that you've got inside yeah. kept growing. And I was thinking, I was trying not to let myself get too carried away. But I was thinking to myself, maybe the Chinese public don't see what your peers in the playground saw when you were growing up. Right. And maybe the Chinese public don't see what your French teacher saw. Mm. Maybe they don't see you as somebody who doesn't deserve a chance. Maybe they don't see you as the person who came to school in secondhand clothes and couldn't afford anything better. Maybe yeah. they see you, I was saying to myself, maybe they see me, how I see me, which is somebody who does deserve a chance it doesn't matter where I came from. It doesn't matter how much money we have or don't have. Maybe mm. they see me how I see me. Yeah. And so every night that I was getting voted through, that little flame of hope inside just kept growing. Mm. And then I had the opportunity then to sing Time to Say Goodbye in the final. And I now describe that song as the song that changed my life forever. Mm. And I know that sounds over dramatic but it totally did because when I sang that song there were 70 million people watching that final yeah and they voted for me yeah so if that doesn't <laughs> if that doesn't mean that that song did, like didn't change my life I don't know how else to describe it that song changed my life yeah because that night they voted for me and I was yeah. not expect I cried I cried well, I'm kind of almost crying now just hearing about it because it's it's such an incredible thing it's such an incredible incredible thing and uh i think i mean china is really a i mean it's a different country but it's really a different country in the sense that you just described they don't have like the social media we do they they have all their own stuff and it's all their own, um, like, I've really enjoyed um, my opportunities to perform in Hong Kong and in China, and I wish I could do it more. Uh, hopefully, you know, in the future when we get to travel again and, and do things again, I, I would love to do it. Um, I mean, people have a lot of opinions on, on China because of their government. Um, but the people of China are so friendly and they are so welcoming. And it's just, it, I, I've loved it. Every time I've been there, I've loved it because it's also like respectful in a way that um, I feel like we've lost a little bit. Um, yeah. You know, in the Western world, um, like there is respect between um you know, young people are respecting the elder people, etc. And it's, um, I don't know, it's, I mean, obviously, I can't say for sure, because I haven't been there nearly as much as you have, but I've, I've really enjoyed it. And mm -hmm. um, I mean, you're getting me excited now to learn some Mandarin, just because I would actually love to come back there and sing something in Mandarin, because I think it would make them so happy. Oh, it does. It absolutely mm. does. Yeah, they they really love it. And, and like I say, it's because they know that their language is difficult. As soon as you try and speak something, as soon as you try and sing something in Mandarin, they are just so thrilled that you made the effort because mm. it is the effort and they recognise that. And that's a really good example of the respect that they show people. You know, they mm. respect foreigners who try. Um, and the example you gave about them respecting their elderly, like we mm. could learn so much from the yeah. Chinese when it comes to respecting our elderly. And I, I really hope that we can learn things like that from them as our cultures try and get closer as well. I, I mean, I know that a few years ago, Britain, we had the golden year of trade with China mm. where we were trying to really strengthen our bonds with China. Um, and it's there's just so many wonderful things that you can learn. It's the same with anything really, you know, when you can learn from another culture and come mm. together to, make things better for either country. It's just totally worth doing. But yeah, 
they do have a lot of respect over there and they are such wonderful friendly people and I just love it every time I go as well like as soon as there's a chance to go over there I'm like right yeah. where's the plane where's my ticket I'm on it let's go <laughs> yeah and so um then after like after winning this competition I'm assuming did you get like a record deal in China what happened um and I'm going to let you talk because you do it so well because I kind of feel like you're also self-made in a lot of ways like you've done so much for your own career like you're not one of those people who will sit around and wait for someone to do something for you so even though you might have gotten a record deal in China or whatever I mean I don't know what's going on with that right now but I see you working really hard and we've known each other for like how many years a few years now yeah, yeah. I mean we sang together in London that must be like I don't know but it's quite a long time ago now It is. I'm trying to think. I'm so rubbish with stuff like this, though. I can't remember. It was a few yeah. years ago. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it must be at least like five years ago. Let's let's say five or, years. If it's any more than that, I'm going to start feeling really old. Okay. Um, <laughs> or, and I, you know, I'm going to get yelled at by the, the people who arranged the whole thing, um, <laughs> if I'm wrong. But I would say five-ish years. It might have been more, it might have been less, but something along those lines. Then we performed together in London. At least then, and as far as I've known you, you haven't had like a big record company behind you doing stuff for you. I always see you like um, hustling and doing everything yourself. And it's so inspiring. I mean, I do a lot of that too, but I think for the people who are watching this um interview show or whatever is and, and especially I mean you don't have to be young I mean god I'm like I'm gonna be 45 this year and I started doing all my own stuff when I was like way after 30 um so mm -hmm. what I'm trying to to you know like I it's just inspiring for people who, who've never tried it and um you know, to see what you can do without a record company or because I think a lot of people are afraid and they're just waiting for someone to take them by the hand and give them a lot of money and lead them through, you know, some sort of like magic portal. Um, <laughs> and it's just not going to happen like 99 million times out of, you know, whatever. It's not going to happen that way. You're going to have to take yourself by the hand and just start doing stuff. So um, with this whole long rant happening now, let's talk about, you know, you obviously getting some sort of deal in China and then um, what happened after that and how did you decide or what happened to make you start doing all the work yourself? Well, okay, so there's quite a few things to touch on here and mm. that is that a lot of people assumed, and so did I, to be honest, um, mm. that something would then happen in China. Um, but, I mean, China's kind of catching up with us now in that they're doing a lot of streaming um, and those kinds of platforms. Mm. But at the time, so this was over, uh, when was it? About 10 years ago now. Mm. Um, there was no record deal that came with winning the show because mm. there was no way to make money from that. If you put out a CD or a DVD, the next day it would be pirated. You'd be making no money. They mm. didn't do downloads. That wasn't a thing. So I did not get a record deal when I finished the show. They gave me my prize money. Mm -hmm. And that meant that I was able to afford a flight home for Christmas. Right. I was chuffed with that. I was so happy because... I didn't have any money to afford a flight home. Mm. The only reason I was able to get out to China in the first place was because I'd won a scholarship from working my ass off mm. to get out there. Otherwise, we couldn't have afford, uh, could not have afforded the flight. Right. So the idea that I'd then have a flight back home for Christmas was like, well, that's not going to happen. <laughs> mm. Mm. So the fact that I then had money for a flight home, I was thrilled with. So... I thought that I'd get to go home, spend Christmas with my family, and then go back out to China and finish my degree. Right. But my mum 
she put about what I did in the local newspaper. She called the local newspaper. She said, my daughter's just done it like a proud mum, you know. Yeah. <laughs> my daughter's just done blah, 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 telling everyone. <laughs> and um, yes. I was then, right, this was my week. And this is what actually happened. So on the Monday, I was the front page of my local newspaper, which was the Citizen in Gloucester, front page news on that paper. Mm. And when I got it, I thought, ah, that'd be nice. I'll keep that in a drawer, show the grandkids one day. That'd be lovely. That was as far as my thought process went. Mm. <laughs> Little did I know, on the Tuesday, I was front page of The Guardian, Whoa. which is a massive newspaper in the UK. And I was in all of the national newspapers, all of them. Mm. On the Wednesday, I was doing radio interviews all day and Decca called my mobile phone. So that's the record label under Universal. Don't know how they got, they got my number at all. <laughs> um, and then on Thursday, I met the representative from Decca, which was their A&R man, Tom Lewis. Mm. He came down to where I was in Taunton. And then on the Friday, I was on national television in the UK on BBC Breakfast in the morning. And then in the afternoon, I was in Universal's demo studio recording a demo for them to see if they wanted to sign me or not. Mm. That was my week. And that That's just insane. blew my mind. Because I thought at the time when I was doing the show, I was thinking, this is a great opportunity. I wonder where it's going to lead. Like, surely mm. this is going to lead to something. I'm on a massive TV pro programme. Somebody's going to hear about it. Somebody's going to find me. And that, that came from an inner-rooted just I think the best way to describe it is I knew that I was going to be a recording artist mm. and I knew that I was going to be a singer that for me inside my heart was unshakable fact mm. I didn't know how it was going to happen or when it was going to happen but it was going to happen yeah and I was going to be a recording artist I just I knew yeah. and nothing could shake that so with every opportunity that I took, I knew it was leading me towards that, even though I didn't know how. Mm. So I ended up making my first album with Decca. So my first album is called Shine. And that was an incredible start to my career. They were able to open up so many amazing doors for me. Mm. Um, and they really gave me such amazing exposure. And a lot of the fans that I've got now in my current fan base have followed me all the way through from the release of my debut album all the way through my career. And mm. I am so grateful for them because as an independent artist now, if it weren't for them, I mm. could not do this. Right. So to them, I am so grateful as well, as well as to Decca for giving me that amazing start. But you were talking about when, um, when I decided that I wanted to work for myself, when I wanted to hustle, when I wanted to make sure that I was giving myself the best chance to pursue my dreams. And mm. that was, that was because it, it became apparent to me that the only person who cares about my dreams is me. Mm. And the only person who has any power to help me achieve them is me. Mm. You might have family members who support you. You might have somebody who comes along who gives you an opportunity. But at the end of the day, they've got their own dreams that they're interested in. They've got their own lives. Mm. Nobody is going to work harder for your dream than you are. Mm. And that became very apparent to me when... So when was it? So I made my first album with Decca and then... I was dropped just before Christmas in 2011. Mm. Um, and it took a while to get back on my feet. I think for about six months, I was moping around in my pyjamas, feeling very sorry for myself. Because <laughs> oh. <laughs> like when you get a record contract, when you're young and naive and you get your first mm -hmm. record contract, you're there going, I'm sorted, I've made it, see you later, I'm yeah. traveling the world, and I'm going to be a recording artist for the rest of my life. Um, <laughs> I'm sorted. You, you feel like that because that's what you see in movies. That's what you see in right. the press, you know. You see this wonderful, like, opportunity that this person's got. They've got their record contract happily ever after. Goodbye. Right. That is what you see. That's not what happens. I mean, spoiler alert, that's not what happens. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I made my first 
first album with Decca and I am so, so proud of it still. But yes, that wasn't, it wasn't going to be my happily ever after. It was, in fact, the best start I could ever have asked for. The mm. gave me. They gave me a wonderful start to my career and I am so grateful for that. It was after the six months of moping around in my pajamas <laughs> that I thought, hang on a minute. Just because I don't have that record contract with Decca anymore, it doesn't take away anything that I've achieved. Right. It doesn't take away anything that I've done and it doesn't take away my voice. Mm. I still have my voice. I still have those amazing things that I've done, those mm. opportunities that I took and made the most of. It doesn't take any of that away. And the one thing that we have to remember about opportunities is that often the opportunities that give you the most satisfaction and give you the most reward are the ones that you create for yourself. Yeah. So many people have this preconception that opportunities just fall in their laps. Opportunities come from other people, from other places. Mm. They do not. A lot of the times the best ones are the ones that we've thought of and that we have got for ourselves. Yeah. So I was thinking, hang on a minute. Why do I have to wait for the phone to ring in order to, in order to live my dream that I still had? I was thinking, I'm 21 years old. Mm. And I felt at the time, I'm 21 and my career is over. My dream career mm. is over. And that's how I felt. Yeah. And it took me six months to realize, well, hang on a minute, you've still got all of your stories. You've still got all of that desire inside you. You've still got that flame of hope. Mm. And even when it's not burning, really really brightly it's still there it's quietly whispering to you you are destined for more mm. and even though even when people say to you even when they say to you no nah, I don't think you can do that or no nah, I don't think that's a good idea or you know they say that's not possible for you just listen to that flame of hope inside mm. and I've come to have a third motto that I really love um and it's when when somebody says that you can't do something like if if some if somebody like my french teacher now would say to me no nah, you can't learn spanish or no you can't learn mandarin or whatever it is i just i think to myself inside i think i can and i will you just watch me mm. and then i set out to prove them wrong and that is such a powerful gift that you can give yourself because as soon as you realize that you can do something, and as soon as you don't listen to the limiting beliefs that other people have for you or that you might have for you, mm. suddenly everything is possible. Right. Because you're able to make your own opportunities and you don't have any of those limiting beliefs. So you're going, right, I've created this opportunity. I know I can do it. They can just watch me do it now. Mm. And that's how I like to approach everything now. And I've, Sometimes I love it when I do something that I've never thought of before or I've never done before because I like the idea that nothing is impossible. I just don't know how to do it yet. Right. And I think that's really, really important advice as well, especially in these times um, of COVID because I recognize myself in what you just said about moping around in a pajamas for six months, because that's pretty much what I did last year. Yeah, but because I felt stuck, like I've always, I have a motto, um, another one that I use a lot that is be water because water can get around anything basically. Love that. You know, like if water keeps dripping for a million years on a rock, you will create a hole in that rock. Or, you know, if a huge rock is blocking your way, the water will find a way around it or under it or somehow. So be water. But when COVID hit, I kind of felt like someone stuck me in, you know, like a plastic um, thing with a lid on it that was waterproof and like, I can't get any, like, I can't do any, I felt, I've never felt so stuck in my life. 
And, and I feel like I'm a person like you who are always trying to find new ways and find opportunity and create my own opportunity. And I felt stuck and I felt helpless. Like someone had tied my arms and feet together and put me on the Titanic and it's sinking, you know? Um, and it was a horrible feeling. It was terrifying and horrible and scary and sad. And I don't think I've been that demoralized or unhappy or, you know, like it was a really shitty year. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like I have no other way of describing it and it's not over, but it took me quite a while to just go through like all the phases of grieving, I guess. Yeah. Um, you know, I've been angry, I've been sad, I've been in denial, I've been doing all of these things. And I'm still scared because, you know, we don't know when we get to, you know, go on stage and do live performances again. And that, in my opinion, is um, the way you should be performing for people is live, because that's where the energy happens between the audience and what you're sending out on stage. Like that's, that's where the magic happens. But until then, we need to find other ways. And for me, right now, it's, well, building this YouTube channel, trying to find opportunities for not only myself, but to bring the musical theater community and singers and, you know, our industry and business together on like one platform where hopefully not only can we inspire other people or entertain uh, people who want to look at this or listen to it, but also maybe find um, new collaborations between each other from different countries, um, find ways of, you know, to keep creating and, and doing things. And obviously, I'm not the first person to think of this. Um, there were people who started doing, you know, digital content, you know, the day after the first lockdown, but I was not there um, because I had worked so incredibly hard for so many years to um, start my production company. And we were finally, you know, making some profit and we were finally getting somewhere, you know, and then everything disappeared, you know, just like, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. but sometimes, you know, you have to, I feel, allow yourself also to just have that mental breakdown because, and I, I mean, if I back up um, through my career, um, I've had smaller breakdowns along the way that I felt were huge then. Uh, not so much in comparison to this, but, uh, you know, every time I feel like I've come back stronger, every time I've been rising like a phoenix from the ashes and just like recreated myself or recreated my own situation. And that's what I feel like you're doing a lot as well. And I think that's the reason our careers have been able to go on for so long. I mean, if, if you're not up for it, if, you're, if you don't have that energy, if you think that um, someone's going to give you the opportunities or things are just going to fall, it's not going to happen. Then, you know, go do something else. But if you do feel that burning feeling inside of you that you have to create or, you, you know, this is what you need to do, there are so many possibilities still. And you just have to say yes. You know, I've tried a billion things through my career. A lot of them have turned out really shitty. Like, <laughs> no, but I mean, seriously, like if you, and I think people are so scared of, you know, oh, someone's going to think that's really bad. Like I have an example. I was asked to sing on like, some sort of weird house music very unclear what it was um but you know i was like and it was a dj and i think he was from canada or somewhere and like oh can you sing on my you know like oh i'm super famous in wherever and can you sing on my um uh, thing and 
I was like, sure, I'll try it, you know, and um, it wasn't good. It was re- like, I can't say that my performance was bad necessarily, but just like the overall product, like the, the whole thing was really bad. So you will find stuff like that if you Google me or, you know, if, because I have tried things. But at the same time, you will also find at least as much, you know, great things. Because, yeah. you know, you just have to keep creating. Um, and, and I think that's a really, really good lesson for everyone who's going to be in this creative field. And, you know, stop being so judgmental. And, you know, like open yourself up to opportunity and say yes to things because you never know what's going to come out of it. Sometimes, you know, it won't be amazing. Like if you look at some of the greatest actors or actresses in the world, I can guarantee you that even Meryl Streep has been in shit movies. (laughs) You know what I mean? But she's been in like, she's been nominated for an Oscar, what, like 18 times and one, I don't know how many of them. But yeah, she's probably been in a bunch of really crappy ones as well, you know? So just like, it doesn't matter. Like, no, you're right. It doesn't matter because you've got to try things to know what's going to stick. Yeah. Try things before you know what's going to work for you. And you don't know when you're starting off. But that's no. That's yeah. And the, the thing is that you talked about um, time to say goodbye being, you know, like your magic song. For me, I think it was Dark Waltz. Mm. Um, and it's really funny because it was a like a, a young relative of mine who played the original for me. And I was like, oh, this is a really beautiful song. And then I played it for someone else. And they were like, oh, you should totally record this song. And then I decided to record it. And um, we decided to do a music video for it, which was more, to be honest, like a little short film. We spent a lot of money on that video. And, um, you know, it ended up winning the Hollywood Music and Media Awards for Best Classical in 2011. And that opened so many doors for me in America. My point being, like, I, because in Sweden, we, we, in our culture, it's not, um, it's not really allowed to sort of step forward and say, oh, I'm really good at something. We're supposed to be like equal and everyone is worth the same and you shouldn't stand out from anyone else. And, you know, like it's um, very (laughs) un-American, you know, like in America, everyone is like talking themselves up. That's something that I learned coming to America, by the way, because when I first came to Los Angeles, I thought that everyone (laughs) was a superstar because that's how they talked about themselves. Ooh, I'm a producer and I'm an actress and I do this and I do that. And I was like, oh my God, what am I doing here? You know, and then you realize that, oh, but it's just their culture. They're really good at selling themselves and talking themselves up. And it doesn't mean that they're they're bad or horrible people. It's just that that's their culture. In our culture, we're not really allowed to do that. And I feel like, ever since I was quite young, my mom and people around me have asked me very politely to tone it down because, you know, oh, no one's going to like you. And, you know, and I, I wasn't liked when I was younger and I've probably not been liked by many people um, over the years, especially in this country, because I take up space. Um, It makes you feel better. That's happened to me as well. It's yeah, just, you assert yourself as, as somebody who has got a dream. Yeah, and I just find it like unless you're in America where they're great at this, they go, yeah, you do that. And I love that. Yeah, um, unless you're in America, they're all there. It, it, you, you talk to tone things down. Um, so there was a lot of times when it mainly talking back at school now, really, where mm. I would be the one who would volunteer for every singing opportunity mm. and I'd get bullies telling me that I was just showing off and mm-hmm. won't I just shut up yeah and things like that but I just you can't let people like that put out that flame of hope inside you you can't let them squash you squash your dream 
because when you know that you want something mm. destined for something better than what they can see in you you've got to remember to sh just show them carry on and you'll show them yeah you'll show them that you can do these things yeah. you'll show them that you are worthy of more time and worthy of having a dream that you can achieve like just do it yeah but, I've, I've, so many of the things you've said have resonated with me there. <laughs> yeah, but I and, and I just think it's so important to bring it up as well because I'm still um, sometimes fighting with you know the good and the bad little person on my shoulders telling right. me to do different things different ways and like oh but people won't like you if you do that and then I'm like well who are people you know what I mean like. If they don't like it, then turn it off or go away, do something else. If you like it, then great, you know, be part of this um, thing that we're trying to create now, for example. Yeah. Okay, I think that the younger generation are getting better at this. They yeah. are creating opportunities for themselves, whether it's on um, different social media platforms. They are not as intimidated by what other people's might think anymore they just throw out stuff on TikTok or wherever it is you know like oh i like look i made a fun video i'm just gonna post it on youtube like my son has his own youtube channel uh with you know like 250 followers and he's nine um and all his videos are like i hope he does he's not gonna watch this um but it's crap most of it <laughs> because he's nine you know like he doesn't understand the power of editing yet so there might be like an 11 minute long video of him eating different kinds of chips you know what i mean like <laughs> it's, but he puts it out there because he's like look mom i made a new video and i'm like <laughs> fantastic so um but, yeah, yeah but you know <laughs> Like, just keep creating. Like right now, him and his friends are making like a bunch of movies. Um, again, like no one's gonna wanna watch it except themselves, but they think it's brilliant, you know? So I'm like, you know what? Keep creating because that's how you get better. And what if in, you know, like 20 years, I sit here and my son, you know won an oscar for best editing or like i have no idea like but maybe it starts here with a stupid little you know youtube video that he's making you know yeah, just absolutely. let people create and, and make things and start doing it yourself don't be so afraid of what everyone else is going to think no one cares everyone is stuck in their own house right now anyway yeah yeah but your son honestly that's so brilliant because that's where a passion is able to grow as well when you're when you're able to explore it and really figure out what you love about it that's fantastic and if his 250 followers really enjoy it then brilliant they found something yeah. they love <laughs> i just I, I had to explain this to somebody the other day and it works for so many things i actually explained it to my friend when she was going through a breakup mm. but it works for music as well where you just have to accept that you can do the best show that you've ever done in your entire life and yeah. you make the best music you've ever made and still not everybody's going to like it. Mm. Does that mean that your show was rubbish? No, it does not. Mm. Does it mean that you're not talented? No, it does not. Mm. It just means it wasn't their cup of tea. And you know what? That's fine. There's yeah. plenty of other things on the internet they can go and watch. If they decide to tell you in a rather rude way that it's not their cup of tea just ignore it because <laughs> that's Delete. a whole different thing but bye bye yeah exactly <laughs> bye, bye but you're never going to please everyone no if you do what you love and you put it out there mm. other people are going to love it too and it's when you find people that love your stuff as much as you love your stuff yeah that's when you're creating a community that's when you're creating your fan base right. that is when you're creating your career because as soon as you create something that you love and you put it out there and you say, I love this, yeah. other people are going to come back to you and say, I love it as well. I'm with you on this journey. You yeah. created a connection there. So you're never, ever going to be everybody's cup of tea. Um, and there's nothing you can do about it. So just no. let that go and move on and create stuff that you love. 
and find your people who love that same stuff and go and have a wonderful career. That's what you got to do. <laughs> and mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was such a wonderful way of sort of tying this interview together. Um, so I think I'm going to wrap it up here. What I would like to do in, in the future, though, is um, to talk to you more about like content creating and, and stuff like that. But we can do that in like a bunch of my tutorials or, you know, things like that, because I feel like there is so much potential from so many people and they are not using it because they don't know how or they don't have the courage to. And I think um, hopefully this uh, YouTube channel that I'm trying to create is going to inspire people and, you know, get you guys going with your own projects and don't sit home and wait for someone to call. Don't sit and wait for opportunity to fall into your lap. It's most likely not going to happen. Start creating, start throwing um, yourself into your own ideas and just, you know, I hope this was as inspiring to everyone um, watching this interview as it was for me to talk to you. So thank you so much, Mary Jess. I'm super excited to, to have you as a friend and as a colleague and to have had you on Toka Talks. I'm thrilled to be on Toka Talks and I look forward to coming back um, as well, talking about content creation because that is one of my favorite things to talk about. Anything to do with creative thinking in business. I love it. So I am looking forward to that. And thank you so much for having me on Talker Talks. Yay. Bye. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.